I'd like to untangle clean tech. I don't like to untangle clean technology. I want to put clean over there and technology over there. Because technology changes everything. Duh. We know that. All technology is clean. All technology is green. All technology is smart. And all technology is sustainable. And it's always been that way. New technologies improve the efficiency or the working of goods and services that we need. And only the new technologies that do that come into the world. So by classifying them in that way, we don't really take ourselves any further forward. All technology is, is, is uh, clean, and technology changes everything. We need to clean up the byproducts of our human existence. These are the solids, liquids, and wastes that we're responsible for. I don't want to get into too much detail, but yes, I'm talking about sanitation and clean rivers, and clean seas, and clean air. And clean air does mean uh, decarbonization, but it means other things as well, which have been with us for a very long time. So I'd like us to go on a journey. We're going to celebrate what we've achieved so far. We're going to look at some of the challenges. We're going to leap into the future to 2200 because it's a lot easier. Um, and we're going to really have a look at what could be a very clean future for us. And I'd just like to bring up one example of how this world is quite difficult when you look at things without taking a generous technology view. I heard only last week that in the North Sea we need to decommission our oil and gas facilities over the next years. And when they're looking at that, they looked at the pipelines that we've laid, and they looked at um, how we're going to clean up these pipelines, and then discovered that actually around the pipelines where you're not allowed to, to, to fish, where rocks have been placed over the pipelines, were in environments where fish were actually thriving. And next to that, where you were allowed to fish, we've been hunting down the last herring for years. So it is a complicated situation. I hope to make it a little bit simpler. And I just want to take you today a little perspective. We're going to try and prevent the, the crocodiles from winning here, because the crocodiles have been around for 300 million years. And I think they sort of every now and again look up and, 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 and see what we're doing. And they see things like save the planet. When actually in science, the planet's fine. The planet's going to be here in 300 million years, floating around, doing what it does, spinning around. It's actually life on the planet that is a little bit more interesting and one that I want to demonstrate has a great future. So we're going to go on a journey um, from Caveman Dave to Spaceman Dave. And we're going to look at some of the energy services that have been needed over time and some of the technologies and how we've gone about cleaning up our act. First and foremost, obviously, one of the issues around this that we need to debate a little bit more than we do at the moment is the number of Daves does make a difference. And I recommend you look at a, a talk given by Hans, Hans Rosling in 2012 called Religion and Babies. I'm not going to give that talk now. You'll be relieved to hear. But in summary, Hans shows that we are basically heading towards a plateauing of our population on the planet at around 9 billion. And the UN Population Division have got three scenarios, one around the 9, 10 billion, which, would, which maps with what Hans is saying, and one which is um, really quite large, goes up 23 billion, and there's one that goes down to three, which seems to be a very credible. This is quite an important difference. If you're an engineer wanting to clean up the world, the graph you're looking at is really the 9 billion one, but the 3 billion one really is exciting. And but we're going out to 2200 hit with this. It's, it's a long-term projection, and these are always dangerous. Hans basically in his talk shows that in order to get a replacement fertility rate, which is how you peak out a population growth, uh, you know, a, a, a fertility rate of two is what you're looking at. And that we, are, we see around the world where mortality rates are coming down, that we are actually achieving that. And we, there's really a lot of things to celebrate in that area. I'm not going to talk more about that. I've just taken the low curve for my talk. OK, so let's go on this journey. Caveman Dave exists in the year dot. The energy services that Caveman Dave needed, basically, were food and heat. He invented this thing, which is a bit of clean tech, or technology, if you like. You know, but it was highly effective. It was, you know, we've always done this from the beginning of time. We pick things up, we make them work, we break them, we, we, we put them to good use. Caveman Dave was able to go really quite long distances around the world using that technology. Chamberpot Dave is the 1950s. Now, that is really um, William Shakespeare, to link brilliantly to the previous uh, speech. Uh, in, in, in 1850, the, the Chamberpot basically was a technology where you threw it out the door, and that drain going down the middle was the technology by which um, you... Uh, um, these slides aren't meant to be going forward, by the way. 
Um, the, um, the, the waste product from that literally washed into the River Thames. And in 1850, the River Thames was declared dead. In fact, it was so dead and it stank so much that uh, the Houses of Parliament on the banks of the River Thames had to um, have a recess, summer recess. And uh, they still have a summer recess, but the, the Thames isn't as dirty as it used to be. But this problem is still with us around the world. And um, loads of people on our planet are still living in the life of the style of chain pot day, but we'll have a look at what the, what the projections for that are like. Um, moving on, Dangerous Dave. I called him Dangerous Dave in the 1950s because Dangerous Dave created this combination of coal and steam and was able to power himself across America and these fantastic machines that we created that enabled economic development, enable us to clean up our sewer system, for example, that you know the Victorians had helped us out with. And Chamber Pot Day's problems were, uh, to a large extent, solved in London through the use of, um, of, of the Victorian sewers. Coal-fired power stations enable people to have heat and light um, throughout uh, the, developing the developing world. Obviously, still in parts of the world, we don't have that service available to all. And we really need to be able to do that. And there were side effects of that. And we had smog in the 1950s. And that's when we saw the first Clean Air Act come in with the, with the Clean Air Act in the, in the UK of 1956, I think it was. Disco Dave was when the party really started. Um, you know, it was get, life was good. We had Earth Day in the 1970s. We had Margaret Thatcher's speech uh, to the United Nations in 1989, a fantastic summary of the challenges that lie ahead. 30 years later, we're still kind of arguing about it, but the science is really now leveling out. So it's about the solutions. And in 1992, uh, we had the Rio Earth Summit. We also worked out that energy efficiency was a fantastic thing, and we really are getting really exciting figures coming through on, on energy efficiency. For example, in uh, today, in the United Kingdom, we use about the same amount of electricity as we did in 1995, and as somebody that used to, as a job, build power stations, that's quite terrifying because you know, this upward sloping graph that we've had for years of always needing another power station every year has gone away, and with energy efficiency, we're becoming a lot better um, uh, efficient users of energy. Peak Dave, well, we all live Peak Dave. We're, we're living in Peak Dave right now, so we don't need to talk about Peak Dave too much. But we have had urbanization. We've seen talks and videos about urbanization. And guess what? Chamber Pot Dave is still a problem. In London, we have one of the biggest infrastructure projects underway, the Thames Tideway, which is going to be stretching right across London. It's 66 metres deep, it's 7 metres wide, and it's connecting up with the Victorian sewer system. So we're still working on that issue that Chamber Pot Dave had, or, or, or William Shakespeare, as we know uh, from the past. But the great news is, is the Thames is not dead. The Thames is alive. It's not alive in the way that it was a 1,000 years ago, but it's actually really quite healthy, and so are some 2,000 tributaries that feed into the Thames were declared clean. But that is not true for everyone around the world. So we have lots of areas where um, uh, people are living um, uh, less well. And we have some old friends come back uh, to haunt us with smog in Beijing and smog in London. The future days of the world have been born, and... Um, they uh, have fantastic technologies available to them. I'm not ruling out any technologies here. All of these technologies are viable. And they really are like the axe. They are really going to propagate across the world very rapidly. They're low cost. They're d deliverable at scale. You can put a solar power plant up, a 1,000 megawatt power plant up in a matter of months. Um, and this is going to be transformative. This is great news. So I'm just going to hopefully just stop the graph a minute. Just have a look at some maths, and I hope you all s were paying attention during Joe's great speech about maths. You won't get too challenged about this. Um, but basically, this is an idea, and it was, um, it's in uh, Sir David Mackay's book, unfortunately he passed away last year, Sustainability Without the Hot Air. And um, that book, had he been alive, I would have tried to persuade him to call it Energy Without the Hot Air, but never mind. Um, we're just going to look at the daily energy services needs in kilowatt hours, a sort of energy unit, don't worry about it, and the number of days that we've got and look at what that means for world energy consumption. So if we look at the days, all these different days, their energy use per capita per day, they need food, they need heat and light, and they need uh, transport, and they need public services and some other stuff. 
So what you see is Caveman Dave, you know, there he is with his, with his, his food and his heat, inefficient use of heat, I reckon. Uh, going through to uh, Chamberpot Dave's uh, Shakespeare's era. And what we've really got is Peak Dave. And I don't think these charts have come across as well as I'd like. Um, but but we've, what we've got there is Peak Dave um, and Future Dave to the right-hand side. And then we've got this middle ground where I'm not dealing with the here and now issues. I'm leaping forward to say that in 2200, Spaceman Dave may not need to use um, that much energy because energy efficiency is going to make a difference in heat and is going to make a difference in transport. So there are all the Daves and their energy services needs on a daily basis. If we look at um, the number of Daves, then we've had this chart before. It's just replaying it, but putting the Daves down. So Caveman Dave is kind of uh, disappearing from our world, obviously. Although I would just like to make the point that the off-grid community out there that are wishing to uh, disconnect themselves from the grid, they are going to have sort of energy services needs not totally dissimilar to Caveman Dave. Um, Chamberpot uh, Dave, or William Shakespeare area, we are fortu fortunately looking at that disappearing completely by 2050. And I think in the, since 1990, something like 1.8 billion people have had improved sanitation services. So we seem to be cleaning up our act there. Um, Dangerous Dave is, you know, he's popular. If you pick coal up and you can just shovel it up and put in a boiler, it's very effective at producing power and, 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 uh, and transport. And that carries on into the 2050s, and we'll have, uh, we'll have that for some time to come. But coal is, is probably going to see itself uh, replaced by other fuels, as has always happened over time. Um, Disco Dave, that party is really starting to go, uh, it, mainly in, in Asia and, and those kind of countries where you're seeing those kind of lifestyles propagate many, many more millions of people wanting to to travel, many more people wanting to uh, enjoy the, the benefits of that life. And we, what I'm really trying to suggest here is we kind of stand on the shoulders of all these people. We, 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 we progress through technology, and we should celebrate that. That's a great thing. We do make a mess, but, but maybe we can clean that mess up. And then we've got the, the people that are the, the peak days that we have, probably all peak days in this room, uh, mo moving out to trying to get to uh, the future days that we talked about. So that... By the time we get to Spaceman Dave, you know, if we could have a population at around 3 billion, you know, then, then that would, could make quite a big difference to this issue. So, Spaceman Dave, what's the world energy consumption going to look like in 2200? Do we really know? We don't really know. I'm not really making that, but I'm just saying this is interesting. We should celebrate the idea that maybe we can do this. And so let's just look at world energy consumption and how that would be affected. If, if those projections for energy use of Future Dave and Peak Dave and Spaceman Dave turn out to be correct and we get any more energy efficiency coming in, and we don't, don't create a new service. I mean, if we create space travel or something, then that's going to be outside the planet anyway, so I'm not sure how I put that on the graph. But um, if we just look at the lifestyles we have at the moment at peak, it looks like that might be all we need and that people will be ha happy with that if we could propagate that more widely. Um, so the world energy consumption, Caveman Dave disappears, Chamberpot Dave doesn't exist very much going out to 2200, Dangerous Dave has disappeared, we still have quite a lot of people uh, uh, looking at Disco Dave, Peak Dave, so we have Peak Daves in 2200 and we have Future Daves in 2200. And that energy consumption is something like 60% lower than we currently have. And if you look at the technologies that we've got, available to us today, then I think, uh, as an engineer working in this industry, that is a very achievable goal, something we should be very excited about, that we're going to disappoint those crocodiles and we're going to be around for a long time to come. And we've kind of always done it this way. We do make messes, we do have Chernobyls, and we do have the River Thames, but like the River Thames, we can clean it up, and like Chernobyl, sometimes it's not as bad. I'm not recommending that we do that, but, but it's not as bad as we sometimes think it's going to be. And I don't think the situation we are in now with regards to technology and making our world a clean place is anywhere near as bad as some of the stories are out there. I think we've got a great chance of reaching um, uh, this goal. Uh, the good news is in uh, the work that I do for the Energy Research Partnership, looking at the utility of 2050, which is relatively nearby, you know, we do have all the tools we need to do this. You know, so that's, that's great news. So I would just like to leave you with um, one thought about um, Spaceman Dave. And I have with me a two-pound coin. And round uh, the two-pound coin, it says, standing on the shoulders of Daves. Uh, actually, it doesn't say that. It says, standing on the shoulders of giants. And I think we are standing on the shoulders of giants. We have come a very long way. And I uh, uh, believe that we've got a very good and clean future. Thank you very much. <laughs>